this is Dina speaking. We're coming to you from the Remnant Nation channel today with a new podcast. So thank you for joining us. And remember, at newwinepouring.com with one W is our Dream Journal website. And so if you want to look for updates, you can go there again at newwinepouring.com with one W. Uh, We just recently put up an article called Some Say Wind, Some Say Fire, Some Say Waves. And that's a prophetic word. I think that you'd probably be interested in it. So feel free to go to that after our podcast. We also have a donate button that's on our website. And if you want to co-labor with us, um, there's a place where you can scroll down and click on that button. It'll take you uh, through the, the PayPal account in order to be able to donate. So thank you for joining us. And we're going to go right into the podcast. You know, in one of the passages I'm going to be looking at today, it starts out with saying that there will be a time when God will judge between the nations and rebuke the people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There will be a time when... We'll not learn all of the skills and all the strategies of war anymore. We won't need to because we're going to be in another place. But we're not in that place right now. We're in a time of the era of the church. And this is before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are in a time of war. We are in a time of conflict. And we're going to continue in that time of conflict until the Lord returns. But before there's true peace... There's going to be the coming of the Lord. There's going to be the day of the Lord. You know, now in the world we live in, if we cry out, peace, peace, the Bible says they will cry out, peace, peace, and sudden destruction will come upon them. So we, w- we don't want to generate a false peace in the earth when there's actually war. In Psalms 144, it says, Blessed be the Lord my God, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. And then if you go down from Psalms 144 to verse 11, which I think is interesting because 11 is a number that speaks of justice and judgment. It speaks of pruning. It speaks of cutting back. I'll talk about more of that later in the broadcast, but Psalms 144, 11 says, Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as pillars sculpted in palace style, that our barns may be full supplying all kinds of produce that our sheep may bring 4,000 and 10,000 in their fields. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speak lying words and whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood. The Lord is the one who gives salvation. This is in 10 above it. The Lord is the one who gives salvation to kings who delivers David, his servant, from the deadly sword. You know, God alone saves from death. And so... What we're going to talk about in this podcast, and I'm going to go into some passages. They're going to be a little lengthy, but they're needed in order to uh, draw the points that we have to share today. But our walk with God is that He is our high tower, our fortress, and a very present help in times of trouble. He's the one that we go to when we have any kind of need. And we need to learn to go to Him right away. And to dwell in the secret place, the Most High. So, as we go forward into this podcast, remember that whosoever calls upon the Lord shall be rescued, shall be saved. And this is God's will for us, that we pray for our our countries, we pray for those that are in leadership, we pray for our families, we pray for our communities. Because we are in the end times, and we cannot avoid the things that are happening in the earth. And uh, we cannot avoid what is to come but we can be in Christ when they do come amen we're going to look a little bit into Isaiah 2 and 3 but before we get into that I want to open up in prayer thank you father 
Father God, I lift up to you all of those that are listening right now. Lord God, you know our past, our present, and our future. God, I just lift up all those that are listening right now, that you minister to them where they're at, what they have need of, Lord, whether it be healing in their body, healing in their mind, or healing in their soul. Father, I pray that there be a special anointing on this broadcast in Jesus' name. Well, I was reading out of Isaiah 2 and 3 today, and it just really resonated in me. I have a burden on my heart. And if you read the Old Testament, you will hear the, um, the major and the minor prophets um, speak of the burden of the Lord. And so what is the burden of the Lord? The burden of the Lord is simply something that the Holy Spirit puts on the hearts of those that are watchmen, uh, his prophets, his ministers, the shepherds. He, he puts a burden on the heart of those that will carry that burden into prayer because it is the heart of God. Remember in the podcast that we had before called A Spiritual Work or A Spiritual Working, we talked about the burden of the Lord. We talked about intercessory prayer. And so this is kind of an offshoot on that, talking about what the burden of the Lord is more than we did the last podcast. And so that is carrying on us through prayer, the heart of the Father, processing them through as he would have us do that. And how he would have us do that is by prayer, fasting with supplications and prayers, making our requests be made known unto God. And so what we do is we come into a partnership with the Father regarding those things that are on his heart. And so if we have a, if we posture ourselves to receive from the Father what is on his heart, then what we are is burden bearers and we're bearing the burden of the Lord. And if we do that, then when we go to him in prayer and we go into the throne room of grace, whereby we obtain mercy in times of need, and we do that on behalf of whether it be nations or cities or people groups, uh, families, household, whatever it may be. If we do that, then first of all, we're praying exactly what needs to be prayed about at the time. And we're in the spirit. And this is a spiritual work because it's not us coming into the presence of God with our own agenda. But it's us coming into the presence of God with his agenda. And we can see how that worked out in Genesis when we read about the story of Abraham. And you see, if you remember, where the Lord approached Abraham regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says that the Lord looked upon Abraham as a friend. In fact, he called him, uh, Abraham was a friend of God. And so we at times, even though the Father is our Father, you know, we also need to be a friend because a friend sticketh closer than a brother. And a friend is somebody that wants to be with you. They're not with you because they were born to be with you. They're with you because they want to be with you. And that's how God wants his relationship with us to be. He wants us to want to be with him. And so when we do that, he shares with us his heart. Just like if you had a good friend that you trusted, you would share with them your heart. And you would kind of open up to them like people do when they have the one their best friends, they have good, close friends, right? So God opens his heart up to Abraham and he talks to him about Sodom and Gomorrah and what he's going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah because the Bible says that the cries of injustice were reaching heaven regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. So obviously there was much suffering that was going on there. We don't even know, even with the little bit that we know about Sodom and Gomorrah, we know the depravity of it. And, and so... Wherever there's that kind of deep sin, there's also deep suffering. And so God was sharing with Abraham what he was going to do with this city. And he did that because he was bringing Abraham into that place of a burden bearer or someone that would carry or take up the burden of the Lord because uh, God does not want to destroy innocent lives. That's not his desire. So it's sort of a mystery as to why that the Lord would need to have someone to intercede on behalf of a city, a people, a people group, a nation. But God and Abraham had rapport going on. They had a covenant between the two of them. And so he was able to bring Abraham in on what he was going to do 
with Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham was a friend of God. And when we are friends with someone, we have a relationship with them. Abraham was in relationship with the Spirit of the Lord. And so we're in this blood covenant with God, and we're his sons and we're daughters, and we're also those that he said that he has set some in the church, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, and there's shepherds and there's elders, you know, and there's, and there's just the saints. And so in all of what I've just laid out, every one of us, part of our Christianity, part of our relationship with God is bearing ye one another's burdens. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing the burden of the Lord is taking up before him that thing that's on his heart, that cry of his spirit. It's sort of like an echo and it comes back to him. And it comes back to the throne. And so the voice of that cry for a lost city, for a lost person, for a lost institution, for a country, for a nation, the voice of that cry is in the voice and the sound of that voice is coming through his beloved. And so it's like Esther petitioning the throne. It's like Esther going to the king and saying, you know, if I die, I die. But I'm going to approach the king about this matter. And so that's kind of like what our interaction with God is. That we go to him, we approach him, and we lay before him that burden. We lay before him our petition with supplications and uh, with intercessions and travail and laborious prayers, we partner with God on behalf of the lost. In that and through that, he's able, his spirit is able to be released throughout all the earth, but it moves the heart of God. And that's his will. It's his will that his people come to him so that he can reach the whole world with the love of his son. You know, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So he gave his son to the world. So his love for the son and his love for the world are the same, right? That's how much he loves. And he wishes that no man should perish, but all come. And so this is what all this is about. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. I was praying for the world that we're living in now. I think everybody knows that we are in the end times. Even people that say they don't believe in God. No. We're at a crossroads, and we're at the point of no return, and we're going to be writing this thing through here soon. And so in Isaiah 2, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. And it reminds me of America. There is no end to our cars. We wind through this country bumper to bumper. We're infiltrated with illegals that have come through the borders. We're full of soothsayers on television telling us everything's okay, everything's fine when it's not. The land is full of silver and gold. We, as individuals, <laughs> probably own more silver and more gold in our lock boxes and our, our little treasure places or whatever all together. I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't have silver and gold, so don't come looking for me, but I'm just saying that all together in America, the silver and gold that we have, just as a people, compared to the rest of the world, is just unreal. And so, when I was reading the scripture, I couldn't help but keep thinking about America. And, and I said, I stopped, I said, Lord, why am I thinking about America when I'm reading this scripture? Why am I thinking about America? It fits so well. And uh, because they're filled with their eastern ways. And we're just filled with a foreign... There's just an atmosphere that's, that's different than it was 10 years ago. Things have changed even five years ago. Things are different than they, they were just a few years ago. I know that there are...